Again, it's so good to be back. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning. I was titled this, Why Can't We Be Friends? Why can't we be friends? And immediately I heard somebody say war. war. So for some of us who are a little bit younger, war was a group in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, mainly the 70s, and they had a song, very popular, and it was called Why Can't We Be Friends? So I just blew my voice out on that song, so I'm not going <laughs> to sing it. But it, it was a very catchy song. It was a hit record. But some of the lyrics in the song ring true today. Now with that, though, if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 4. We're going to look at 11 verses. 11 verses. And we're going to talk about this thing today. And, and the thing that uh, that's interesting about this word this morning is this, is that this was given to me several weeks ago. And as we prayed this morning and shared testimonies this morning, I was blown away by several of the testimonies that really address, I mean, what we will hear this morning as it happens very, very often. So, if you will, we're going to go to James chapter 4. We're going to look at 11 verses, 1 through 11. You there say amen. 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 All right, all right. The Bible reads, What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you want. You want what you don't have, I'm sorry. So you scheme and kill to get it. I'm going to explain that a little bit later. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Verse 4. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Don't you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace gener generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. And I'm going to stop at 10. I'm going to stop at 10. Uh, one of the things we see, and one of the things that just is just in, at an absolute all-time crazy high, is where we've seen the church, segments of the church, lock arms with the world. And the excuses that are made are mind-blowing. Some of my favorite uh, former favorite gospel artists have decided to do just that. They've gone away from traditional Judeo-Christian values and ethics, which all come from this Bible, to say, hey, it's okay for me to lock arms and do a song with this person, even though they worship Satan. How is this possible? It's possible because the church is silent. Those of us who know better, we're quiet. We still buy their records. We still support them. There are pastors who have great followings who are doing awesome things, things, so it appears, have decided to lock arms with secular entertainers, with secular companies who they know that serve Satan, yet they say, I'm here, and it's okay. God sanctions this. 
And how many of you know that that's a lie from the pits of hell? The only business we ever have locking on with the world is to be an influence on that particular platform, whatever it might be. And I could go on and on. There's so many different things that are happening from a worldly perspective. Even the church itself has just allowed things to come in. And Jude warned us. Jude said that they would creep in unnoticed. They would creep in where we wouldn't even know it until it was too late. And we were watching the very essence of this take place week in and week out in churches. You better be careful and you better be very, 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 very careful where you choose to worship, who you choose to watch. There are some preachers I used to watch. They're now saying, well, I don't know about the homo. I don't know about, you know, homosexuality. I don't know. Well, why don't you know? It's right here in black and white. And some of it's in red. Why don't you know? And it blows my mind because these are guys who are considered such men of God. But they've chosen to lock arms with the world. And it really grieves my heart. And if you love God, it should grieve your spirit and your heart. There were two separate pastors, and I, and I got to just say this, just get this off of me. Just the last two weeks, and one very popular, not the, right down in, in uh, Lithonia, Stone Mountain. And here's what he said. He said, Jesus Christ, the living God, who was dead, buried, rose from the grave. He said he was out of order as a child. Jamal Bryant said, Jesus Christ was out of order until he began his ministry at 30 years because he was under the authority of his earthly dad instead of his heavenly father. I almost flipped out. As people said, preach, preacher. Hey, man. I'm like, what are y'all talking about? That would mean then that Jesus sinned. My Bible tells me he was without sin and he was getting, there was nothing about him that was sinful. As a matter of fact, he was the only one that ever lived that was perfect. Amen. Yet, this man had the gall to say he didn't reach this. He was out of order. And then Michael Todd, some of y'all like him, well, he said Jesus never reached his full potential. Same thing. Well, what, what is wrong? What's wrong with this is that they've crept in, like you told us, unnoticed. And then folks in the church, I'm not going to call them believers, are co-signing on by the thousand, by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands. So the question arises, then why can't we be friends with the world? Why? Well, James just told us. Now, my first point, what does friendship with the world then look like? What does it look like? Well, I've described some things blatantly, but see, it's not always those blatant examples. We got some other examples. We need to do some house cleaning within our own houses. Look at me, within our own houses. Do you hear me today? Within our own selves. One clear indication that we have made friends with the world is our behavior. Is our behavior. It, it's, it's so, it's so, it's so indiscriminatory and it's so small and minute until we get into a, a way of doing things and then it becomes acceptable. What am I talking about? Our behavior, how we act, what our attitudes are. When we act like this, we're acting just like the world. And that's what Paul was dealing with. See, Paul, uh, I'm sorry, James was dealing with. Uh, are we, I got a few questions here and I'm going to come back. Are we acting like the people of the world? Are we? Can people tell you belong to God? Or can they, 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 there's no difference. I don't know who's who. Do we quarrel? Do we covet? And do we fight? That's what James was dealing with. Now, I got to say this. This was not a one-time thing. We all going to quarrel. We all going to fight. We all going to have misunderstandings. This was ongoing in this particular church. It was going on so much, he just finally said, let me, I gotta address this. What is your problem? Another question, do we harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in our hearts? Do we? Is that somebody that you just can't get over it and you just bitter and it's caused you to almost pass out every time you see them? Are you jealous because somebody can sing better than you? 
They can preach better than you. They can play golf better than you. <laughs> Are you jealous because uh, my neighbor's lawn is greener than mine? What is he doing over there? See, it doesn't stop at the, at the stuff we can see. It's the stuff within our hearts. It's the motive. It's the things that we say quietly. Nobody hears but the Lord. Right, right. See, I can't hear it. I can't look at you and tell what you doing or how holy or unholy you are. But it's the things that come out in your mind that is just like the world. Checking it off. Do we boast and then deny the truth? Do we find disorder in every evil practice in our lives? If, you always, if your life is always in some kind of disorder or disarray, you act just like the world. The world is all about chaos. It's all about disorder. It's all about just always being on edge. Do you find yourself there always on edge? Something happens, I'm on edge, and my voice is risen, and now I'm talking in a high, in a different uh, range. And I look around, who's that? See, all of these things emulate the way the world functions. See, y'all thought I was just talking about Jamal and, and the craziness and Michael Todd. No, we got some stuff we need to look at. Because this is the bride of Christ and the world is watching the bride of Christ. And I got to believe the world is saying, I want no part of that. They ain't no different from me. Do some of you just cuss because you can't help it? Just cuss it. I'm saved, but sometimes I got to cuss. You know what I mean? Sometimes I'm hearing this. And now we even have the audacity to have cussing preachers. Right. Cussing preachers. <laughs> and people sit under that. The Bible says, how does good and bad come out of the same mind? How does bitter and sweetness come out of the same mind? It can't. And so James addresses these things. Another question, are we Peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and the fruit. Impartial. In other words, you can't sit by them because they're white. I got to find them a black church. Can't be sitting by them white devils. Oh, my church is out way out there in Concord, Georgia. Well, we can't have them, you know, them colors in here. It's real. It's real. See, that's how the world thinks. That's how the world, that's how Satan breeds division. That's how Satan breeds divisiveness. And then we, the church, we sit back and we go to our little black church. We go to our little white church. We go to our little Spanish church. Don't you know that Satan is loving every bit of that? That's how the world acts. Or instead, do we display deeds in the humility that comes from wisdom? Mm. See, that's what we got to park. That's what we got to land. But that takes some work, people. It just doesn't happen because you got to say, I have to say this before I move on. Many of us get saved, and please catch this. The Lord gave me this, and, and it, it's kind of messed me up a little bit. Many of us are just like these people in the church James is dealing with. Because they never did what Jesus did. What was the first thing Jesus did when he was released to his ministry? He was driven into the wilderness to deal with his flesh. Have you been driven to deal with your flesh? Did you just get saved and then go right back to how you were living? Think about it. A lot of people get saved. What do they do? Go right back to how they were living. Oh, I got saved yesterday. And then the next day they right back to doing whatever they were doing. Jesus sets the expectation. See, we're to be imitators of God, right? Jesus is God, correct? So what do we do? We're to look at his life and say, wait a minute. He did this, this, and this. This is the route I should be going. But when they tried to come after him, what did he do? He prayed for who? His enemies, did he not? What did he do? When it was time, when it got too much for him, instead of cussing people out, he said, I'm going to talk to my heavenly father. Did he not? So Jesus 
dealt with his flesh the moment he got saved. And I got to tell you, I believe many churches do disservices because discipleship is a word. We don't even know what it is anymore. We get folks saved, but really the Lord gets folks saved, and we brag about how, folks, we had 35 saved. We had three. We had 300 saved. Wait a minute, what, what's this we stuff? Last time I checked, the Lord saves folk. Now, he uses us, but we can't take any credit for that. He gets all the glory. He gets all the credit. Friendship with the world rubs off on our Character. If you think you just hang out with folks and it's not going to affect you, you are a F O O L. The fool. If you think you can just hang out with the same people and I, I, well, I'm not doing anything, you're fooling yourself. Now, the plural usage of quarrels and fights indicate this was chronic. This was going on and on, and this was actually, get catch this, this was actually demonic. See, we don't think we, I see we look at too much sensationalism in so many churches. It, let me just tell y'all. If you go to a church, or their church, their whole deal is we're a deliverance ministry. We cast out demons every week. Well, how many demons are you going to cast out every week? You got the same folks coming every week they got a demon. There's something wrong with that. Every week I'm casting out a demon. Sir, this is a stick. This ain't no church. Every week I'm casting out demons. The problem with demonic activity is a lot of times we don't even know it's demonic. Mm -hmm. See, we've accepted some things that we think is just normal behavior, and Satan is wearing us out with it. That's what James is dealing with. This was a chronic problem. When there is constant chaos, constant division, it is satanic. Trust me. When you have envy and bitterness in your heart, you are playing in the field of Satan. When you can't love on somebody, you sit back with kind of the side eye until they look at you and you smile like you're good. You are right in Satan's wheelhouse. And that's what James is dealing with. The disputes could have taken form of arguments and controversies for teachers and factions. Well, I like Pastor Dave better than Pastor. And Pastor came too loud. Pastor Dave is calm, cool, collected, and he's smooth and he delivers that word. But Pastor Kid, he all loud. He walk around, <laughs> rolling his neck. That's that black stuff. I like Pastor Dave. He's distinguished. <laughs> That's demonic. You know why? Because both men are servants of God and they are bringing the word of God. Amen. And if you're sitting there grappling with that, then you better say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me in this area. I'm telling you. See, again, Satan. It's so smooth how he creeps in. I know we can see the big stuff, but it's these little things like foxfires that begin to erode the fabrics of the faith and the bride. And the world is watching. It also could have been struggles about, listen to me, worldly affairs, such as personal influence and financial gain. These people were up in church arguing and upset because somebody got blessed more than somebody else. Let one of y'all get blessed. I'm going to be like, Gene, where you at? Do, 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 do. I'm going to be happy for you. Especially if it's in the financial kind. Because I'm all oh, that offering play. Y'all better not tell me you got a raise. I'm like, oh. Do, 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 do. Y'all know I don't talk about money like that. So once y'all get, get, get afraid, I don't even look at your finances. But you better not tell me you got a raise. <laughs> but they were arguing about stuff like finances and, and who was the most influential. Well, I got more, more uh, swag than you do in the church. They were arguing about stupid stuff like that, which is demonic. Satan had made his way in, and now they're dealing with the demonic right here in this church. Now listen, the Greek word translated desires is etymologically eth to the English word hedonism. Hedonism. Are you familiar with hedonism? Yes. Hedonism, for those of you who aren't, who you aren't I, I got uh, one yes or one semi-amen. Hedonism is the philosophy of living to gratify yourself and yourself only. 
self-gratification. I'm doing life for me. And that is what was going on here as well as James addressed it. He said, the desires of your heart are this. And you pray and you ask, uh, you're not even asking for what you want, but you're trying to steal and you want and you hate on somebody else for what they have. That hedonism. In Luke 8 and 14, Jesus used the same word to describe this group of people. Listen, this group of people, and here it is, crowded out the cares, riches, crowded out by the cares, the riches, the pleasures of this life, and they never grew into maturity. Well, who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus was the sower, and he sowed the seed, right? There were four groups, and that third group was the thorny group. When the seed fell on that thorny ground, it sprang up quick, but it got choked out because they supposedly got saved and went right back to the cares of the world, right back to chasing the almighty dollar, making that number one, right back to all the other things that everybody else does. And then Jesus became so minuscule and so small until it choked it out of them, and they never matured according to Luke 8 and 14. Pleasure describes any personal goals such as money, reputation, or success, which contributes to personal accomplishment, accomplishment rather than what is your will for me, God? Brother, what is his will? What is his will for me, church? We've got to start asking questions like that. These sinful desires, listen, lay within each of us as believers right now. They express our pre-Christian nature still seeking to control our lives. I know we're fighting it. I know we all want to be rich. I'm not going to even ask you to raise your hand because everybody in here will take four, five million dollars. And half of us will do whatever to get it. If that ain't you, don't worry about it. Don't be offended. Well, why he said, well, you must be one of the ones. <laughs> Because if it's not, you would not be offended. See, people get offended when truth is spoken. Those are the very ones whose hearts are right there. So don't tell on yourself. Just not say, amen, pastor. And then ask God to help you when you get home. These sinful desires lay within each of us. And I'm telling you right now, they seek to control us. That's why Galatians chapter 5 talks about there's a war going on between our flesh and what? Our spirit. It's back and forth. That's why we have to fight. And that's why we need to meet because we need each other. We need each other so I can look in your eyes and say, are you okay today? And if you tell me, well, yeah, I already know you're lying. Yeah, no, no, you're not. Come here, let's go pray. Boy, get over here. Let's go pray. Come on, young lady, let's go pray. We need to pray. Let's get another lady. We're going to go pray. Because I know you're not doing all right. It's people tell me they're okay every week. I know they might. You can't be okay every day. We live in a fallen world. We have things coming at us. And if you really try to follow Christ, the enemy is at you. And this warfare we're talking about is back and forth all the time. That's why he says we must fight. That's why Paul says, I'm pressing. Why? Because stuff is coming at him from left to right. He said, I press towards the high call. That means that's some stuff trying to keep him back, right? He's got a push hard. He's, he can't win by himself. I'm just done. I'm just going to go kill myself. Yeah, that's what the enemy wants you to do. And he'll hang your pill bottle to help you out. And he'll push you off the bridge if you get close enough to the edge. And he'll help you with the trigger finger. That's why we have to fight. And we got to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. And then I can be in tune with my brothers and my sisters. And I know when you walk in, you ain't okay. Let's go pray this thing off of you. Do, okay, we need to do more to pray. Let me come sit with you for a while. Okay, I need to, okay, let me help you with whatever it is you need help with. See, that's when we know we're loving each other. Then the world sees that and they go, I might think about that organization over there. Well, what are they called? Them, them, them Christians? What, what are they? Christians will never be freed from the evil influence of these subtle yet wicked desires. But by God's grace, we can escape their, den their uh, denomination over us. For they try to dominate us, their dominion. After observing rampant worldliness in the lives of the readers, 
James launches into a warning. And he gives a harsh assessment. And he gives a harsh warning. He says, you adulterers. Guys, that was a major insult. God, God, hear what he said. He is hammering right now. James, that, that whole book, the whole book of James, James is a bam, bam. He says, you adulterers. Don't you realize the friendship of the world makes you an enemy of God? I say again, and he doubles down. Don't you realize that this makes you an enemy of God? Now, he's the, in the King James, the word is enmity. And let me explain what that is. Enmity is animosity. You may be saying, well, I don't have any animosity toward God. Me and God cool like that. You know, me and JC, well, you already at enmity with God. You don't be calling the Lord and saying, no, JC. <laughs> There's no reverence there. We would always have reverence for our Lord and Savior. Get too common, JC. I wish I would. Not JC. Come on. That's so out of order. But it is an act of being opposed to someone. A common biblical metaphor for spiritual unfaithfulness in our relationship with God is adultery. Jeremiah addresses it. Ezekiel 16 addresses it. But there's no other place in the word, in the word that addresses it than Hosea. Hosea, if you don't know anything about Hosea the prophet, he was considered a minor prophet because of the, his, his book was small, not, not because he was minor, but because it goes by how big or how small the book was. Hosea, literally, God had him to marry Gomer. Gomer's job was a prostitute. Gomer did good the first couple years. But y'all know what they say. Some of y'all know all that ain't going to say. Gomer couldn't help but to go back to what she used to be. And so Gomer would go out and be in the streets and have many, many lovers. And, uh, and Hosea is so upset. And he says, Lord, I'm done with this. I can't. And he says, get up, Gomer. And get up, Hosea, and go get her. Bring her home. Clear her up. Brush her off. He go get her find her somewhere, pull her from some guy's bed, and then she would go again. Now they got children now, and she would go again, and he's upset, I got kids. Get up, go get her. He would go, go drag her from wherever she was, under some rock with guys, dust her off, and treat her like she never left. And she continued, and finally, God says, Hosea, this is exactly how I feel my people. This is exactly how I feel. I, I, I've given you everything. I'm faithful. I've delivered you time and time again, yet you continue to worship the God of the Amorites. You adulterer. You continue to worship Baal. You continue to burn your children in the fire. You continue just to be rid of me and then only call me when you want something. You know now how I feel. Let me put it on human terms. How many of you had your hearts broken? And you're still trying to get over Third grade. You still think about little Ricky from the third grade. Some of y'all. Some of y'all. Third grade still. If I see him today. <laughs> then some of y'all had, 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 had girlfriends. Some of us guys. And we picked our wife based on what that girlfriend like because your heart was crushed. Think about God. We've chosen thing over thing above him, and yet we want everything from him. Think how he must feel. And this is what being friend with the world produces, us being called adulterers. While God showed unfailing love to Israel, they responded with faithlessness, immorality, and idolatry. Over and over and over again, Scripture depicts God as the husband of his people and the believers as his bride. And we find that in Jeremiah 2 and 2. Ephesians 5, 22, 33. In Revelation 21, 79, where he repeatedly talks about how he's our will and how we were his bride. And there's an expectation on us, church, as his bride. So when James calls his audience adulterers, the implication is clear. They understand what he's talking about. There's no doubt. To the God who loved his people unsparingly and relentlessly, what could be more painful than 
heartless betrayal. Mario spoke a phenomenal message a couple of weeks ago about betrayal. And as he spoke it, I went on vacation. I had to listen to it. And as he spoke it, I had knives going in and out of my soul. See, here's the thing again. Even though, even though we forgive and God forgives for us, we can forgive, but we don't forget. That's why sometimes it's still painful. And when we see or hear a certain name that, that's truly harmed us, it's painful. And it still hurts. But that doesn't mean you have to forgive. Let me move on to point number two with a question. Y'all ready? It's a question. How can we be sure we're not setting ourselves up to be enemies of God? We talked about what it looks like now. See, we, we thought it was all this grandioso stuff. No, it's the, it's the little stuff that we become enemies with God. How can we set ourselves up to be sure that we're not enemies of God? How can we do that? Let's look here. Christians, first of all, cannot, Reverend Rob in the back, you need to hear me. Boy, you was preaching the message before we got to it. We cannot, listen to me carefully, we cannot, this is very, very plain but very powerful, peacefully coexist with evil. How can you peacefully sit in a place, in a business, uh, wherever you work, wherever you go to school, how can you be at peace with that? If you're at peace with it, that means you're friends with the world. As believers, we cannot settle. We cannot say, well, that's just how it is. That means we've locked on with the world, and we've accepted what Satan has forced on us. See, here's, here, here's the thing. I got to say this. I got to say this. A lot of the evil that is happening, a lot of it, it's not that it's that we don't expect it. But here's the problem. And here's where the church falls short and we've locked on to the world. It's not that we want to dog them out or talk about how evil they are, but they want to force it down our throats. They want to tell us if we don't accept that we're homophobes, if we don't accept that we're this, if we don't, we don't accept that we're that. And at the same time, we can't even stand up and declare our faith without being talked about. I'll be called, I'll be, uh, uh, now y'all realize we've been called terrorists, right? If you walk for Jesus Christ, you stand on his name, you try to present, you're a terrorist. If you want to raise your children in a, up, in a God, God, uh, a God fearing manner, you too, sir or ma'am, are a terrorist. That's how you're being labeled right now. But as believers, we better stand up. And we better say, I do not agree. And sometimes we need to take a stand and walk away if God tells us. Because he's your provider. James calls it out and challenges people who have turned their hearts away from God and who's fallen in love with the world. He calls it out. When he speaks of the world, he means the system, the world system, the order, the way things are. And it's consisting of people, listen to this, whose beliefs, values, and morals are in opposition and in rebellion with God and his word. That's how you know. The goals and objectives of the world are in direct conflict with God's word and his commands. To cling to the world is to choose enmity with God. That means to be, what again? Have animosity between me and God. That's what that means. James warns believers not to cultivate a lifestyle that resembles friendship with the world. That's why, again, we can't be looking like the world with how we live. We can't. Let me, I want to speak to just some of our men. I want all of our men in here. I need all, I need everybody's attention. Everybody, all of our men especially. Especially. Here, here, listen to me. I know we got to have old acquaintances. And I know we go to reunions, we go to birthday parties, we go to this and we go to that. When you go, I got a question. Do you acquiesce to back how it kind of used to be? A few words here and there. Uh, some little jokes that are inappropriate. Do we just kind of stand there? Or do we say, that's not me anymore? Do we fall to the pressure of how it used to be? Or do we stand and say, well, hold on, I'm a king of man. I can't partake in this. In a minute, if we're not doing that, we're holding arms with Satan and in opposition. Of God. Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, let me put it this way. How many masks do you own? Do you got one for work? One for the gym? One for church? One for the grocery store? Or are we going to be the same person wherever we go? 
What's it going to be? Are we going to be the same person? Or do we have a different persona when we go to different places? God's calling us, God. He's saying, you're just like the world if that is you. No, you ain't killing anybody physically. But you're just like the world if that is you. So here are the remedies. I know you're dying to get the remedies. The remedies are right before you. It's not like anything you've never heard, but we need to be reminded. Here we go. We must first do what? Seek God first. Matthew 6.33 says this. So I'm going to give you two scriptures. I'm going to read them all. Matthew 6.33 says it. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Let me read this again. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of those things will be added unto you as King James Version. First Timothy 6 and 6 through 10. For those of you who are killing yourself to be rich, listen to these words from Paul to young Timothy. Verse 6. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great work, great wealth. See, half the church don't believe that. The pastors who get in their congregations to buy them Bentleys and Maybox and and whatever, and watches and Movado, they don't believe this. Because they got a Timex and he can't be continuing on the, on the TikTok talking about if my church loves me and how come I ain't got no Movado? Maybe because you don't need a Movado. Maybe you need Jesus. How about that? After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Come on, y'all. Come on. What is wrong with it? How come, why, if it ain't just perfect, if everything's just not enough, I just don't have any rest and peace. That's because your peace is Jesus Christ. You ain't consulting him. You're too busy living like the world. Oh, y'all thought I was going to talk about T.D. Jakes and all that stuff. Man. They got their own set of issues. It's time for us to deal with us. Verse 9. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. That is 1 Timothy 6, 6-10. For those of you who thought or who think, Lord, if I just get this much money, all of my problems will be solved. I'm telling you right now, that's the biggest lie ever, ever put out there. It's the biggest lie. I ain't never been rich or nothing, but I've had quite a bit of money at certain times. And let me tell you, it is absolutely the biggest lie in the world. It doesn't bring you peace. It allows you to pay your bills on time. It allows you to maybe get out a little debt. But you still got the same problem everybody else has. Uh, dealing with this flesh. Okay. Then you get a little money. Not only do you got to deal with your flesh, now here come baby baby now. Yeah. <laughs> they want some of it. Everybody got their hand out. Everybody. Quick story, true story. I learned this while I was away. Uh, my mom came into some money some years ago. Her, her uh, uh, first cousin passed, and she didn't know this. Left her some of the money from you know, her passing from some land down through the family. And uh, one of my, uh, my mom lives very meekly in a, in a little small trailer that her, her husband left her. It's paid for, so she's like, I don't need anything. Can't get her to come here, so she's just there in her little small place, and her air stopped working. Now, it stopped working in Memphis, and the heat is like, here, it's hot. So her uh, cousin, who works kind of in the air conditioner deal, or used to, found out she had some money. So that rascal goes and said, look, look, I can take care of this for you. He went over there 11, 12 times and supposedly fixing her situation. Supposedly. And never and it doesn't work today. Wow. And he shows up at the birthday party, just smiling and cheesy. 
the the the, the flesh want to do some damage. <laughs> I just say it that way. But the spirit says, I got it. I got it. But you know what his problem is? He's thinking that little bit of money going to do him good. All it's done is put him at odds with God and with his family. This is so why. So what's the point? What's the point, Master? Why are you telling this? Because many people have pierced themselves chasing a dollar. For what? If you're walking with the Lord, he already said, seek me first. You have everything you need. What is your issue? You're consulting your friends. You're consulting your financial advisor. You're consulting your CPA. You're consulting all these other entities. And God says, I created all of this. What are you doing? Get on your knees, you sinners. Purify your hands. Come see me. And I'll take care of you. One other quick little story, and I'll move on. That's what happens when I'm gone a long time. I stay a long time. I'm going to get out of here, I promise you. I promise you, I'm going to get out of here. So, we sold our house recently. Many of you know we, we've been moving and stuff. And so, I, I can't stand the whole closing process because you got crooks in that too, you know. We're supposed to get this and then, well, wait a minute, we got $2,300 missing. Well, you get this, but that ain't, that's my money. I don't tell you what I'm getting over here. Give me $2,300. I don't care what you say. We, we, hey, listen, would you agree, hon? We, we want that $2,300. Well, it worked it out and had some kind of jargon come back, and so we didn't, we, we didn't get the money. And my wife is emotional. She's upset. And I'm upset with her, but I can't be the same upset if it's not good for the house. So I said to her, and it just, the spirit hit me, and I said, honey, we're going to be fine. We, we, we good. We'll get, we, the Lord will take it. He sees. When I tell you two days ago, we got a check in the mail for $2,600 that we had no idea was coming. You see what God did right there? See what he did? We could have acted a fool with them. We could have gotten, we could have gone after them. We could have called the customer out. We said, mm, not going to do it. Not going to do it. It, that's okay. If you got to steal from us, that's okay. And God said, there you go. There's your money. I'll take care of them. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Let me give you one more while I'm at it. So we're at a hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee is scary. Because everywhere you go, they got security. I'm just telling you. I can say that because I grew up there. Uh, beautiful town. Beautiful little part of town. And, and the guy comes in. Well, we got security all night watching the car. I'm like, good Lord. We're in the best part of town. You got to have security watching the cars. So I'm scared of it. This joint. So anyway, we, we're there, we have to, we're checking in. When I tell you, I made this reservation two weeks prior to going, this guy has us waiting, Sandra. We're waiting, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm starting to boil a little bit. And the Holy Spirit said, hold your horses, big boy. Because he kept looking at the page and kept going over here, then went and got his manager. And this is not 30 minutes in, just about. And, 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 my, and I could feel my wife. And I just said, Holy Spirit, you got to stay calm so she stays calm. If you start, this going to be some of them. You know how you Memphis folks are. So I stay relaxed. And I was very calm. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So he finally found it. And he says, I'm so sorry for, you, for your wait. Thank you. Thank you for being patient. And I, and I was going up in the, in the uh, elevator. I said, they, they cussed out a lot today. I said, that's why we didn't need to do anything. I could tell they been, had trouble. So as we get up, we need something. And, and, and uh, so I go downstairs to get it. And so I'm going to purchase it. And the lady goes, the guy goes, hey, you, you're the Moors. Y'all went down here earlier. Hey, that's on the house. I said, oh, thank you. And then he says, because your witness was so calm, your demeanor and your wife was so calm, I will never forget this. I was like, wow. Walk up the room, hey, look what I got for free. <laughs> And she said, well, did you get some chips and some? I'm like, no, 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 I didn't. I didn't get any chips. So the next day, I go down, and I go get some candy and some chips. And the lady's there. And I said, I room. She said, you want to oh, uh, charge the room? Or you want? I said, no, I'll just pay. She said, no, you won't. Because of how y'all care. I said, I got chips. <laughs> When we act like and look like the kingdom, what does God do? He blesses your work. 
He blesses him. You know, I was born and I was seething. He said, no, no, hold your horses. And watch me work. And then watch heaven be glorified because of what you do. Do we bring glory or do we bring chaos? What are, what are we doing, church? What are we doing? Romans. Let me read this one. The repetition, James emphasizes that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. With the same Greek word translated enmity in James 1, 4, Paul denounces the word, that worldly mindset. He denounces it. Paul denounces it in Romans chapter, uh, one of our favorite chapters, chapters 8, verses 7 and 8. He says, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Y'all check it. Did you hear? It's the word. If anything or anyone takes a more important place in our life than our relationship with God and Jesus Christ, we have probably entered into friendship with the world and enmity with God. Jesus confirmed it. Y'all know what he said. He said, y'all say the last word for me. No one can serve two. Oh, we can do better than that. No one can serve two. You're either going to serve one, and he says, or hate the other. So we better make up our mind, church. We better make up our mind. Then he, then, then he says, either you will hate one or love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other, Matthew 6, 24. Pursuing friendship with the world puts us at odds with God and in danger of forfeiting our souls. What it really, what it means here is this. We, we could have made a profession of faith many years ago, or maybe even a few years ago. Listen, a profession of faith proclaiming but not truly following, not truly trusting, right? John talks about they were with us, but they proved they were not of us because they left away from among us. So do you really, have you really trusted him to be your Lord and Savior? That's what he's talking about here. On the other hand, we seek fellowship with Jesus by giving up our own way, taking up our cross, and following him, we gain everything we need in life and in the one to come. Guys, take up your cross and follow him. What does that mean? We say it, it sounds biblical, it sounds spiritual, it is biblical, it is spiritual, but what it looks like is what I want to do versus what God wants me to do. I lay what I want to do down. So I'm going to take up his cross and what he asked me to do. Sometimes that's suffering. Sometimes they're staying in a job that I hate, Pierre, but you got a reason to be there, Pierre. Those children need a Pierre Lafon. They need a real man of God. They don't need no wimp up in there. They need a man of God who's not shaken by a little chaos. They need somebody who's steady in the storm because he served the one who calms the storm. That's what they need in there, Pierre. So you hang in there and you stay until God said, oh, because it's not about you right now, Pierre. It's about those kids need to see what a real man of God looks like. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. If we try to hang on to the old worldly life, and the way the old worldly way of life, Jesus said, we will end up the, what losing everything. He said it this way: What is the profit of man to gain, gain the world and do what? Lose his, lose his soul. What is the profit of man to gain the whole world yet lose his soul? But if we give up our life to cultivate friendship with Christ for the sake of the gospel, we gain salvation and everlasting life with Him. Mark eight thirty five. We must be careful. Come on, Gene. We must be careful not to deceive ourselves into thinking we can live in close fellowship with God and at the same time set our hearts on things of the world. Did you hear what I just said? We can't be listening to Beyonce Thursday and then coming here singing Hezekiah Walker on Sunday. I'm telling you, Queen B is evil. She's a witch. She can't spell on because she got people now have left her band because she's worked witchcraft on them. Jay-Z is a Satan worshiper. These people we're listening to, we can't listen to. We can't. We have to be very, very careful. 
of what we allow into our space, which is this. Last thing, we must remember what happened to Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? She lived in a very wicked and evil time. They were prosperous, yet there was so much sexual immorality going on. And the Lord said, don't look back. Her looking back was an indication she really had never left. She was still there. And her end was a pillar of salt, frozen. Now, I can't say whether it was salvation or not, but boy, I would not want to go to heaven bound up like that. The Apostle Paul teaches Christians to cultivate here a singular focus. I'm going to end on this verse, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Since you have been raised to new life of Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Heaven is real, y'all. While Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in you. God, would you stand? Father, forgive us for where we have at times looked just like the world, yet we belong to you, so forgive us. We're all guilty to some degree. Father, forgive us when we have lost our cool in a, in a situation where we could have been light in a dark space. Father, help us to understand that you have all power and we're to seek you first. Every single thing. In everything. Not some things in everything. Lord, forgive us when we go to our own leading and our own thought pattern and we forget about you just like the world. Lord, help us to be distinguished from the world. Lord, let this little church be a church that the light shines on from you and the outside world sees us and says, that's different. They look like they might have been with Jesus. Lord, help us to clean up our lives personally and then collectively that we may be pleasing to you. Help us, here it is, to yield our everything to you. Lord, we give you glory and honor. We thank you. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Church set? Amen. 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 Well, this is our fourth Sunday, and, I, and we have some guests and visitors back there, and I know that one young man back there. But we, 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 this is our fourth Sunday, and we are, we do uh, communion. So, uh, very, very special time, as this is a commemoration. Jesus gave us two, I, I have one over there, thank you. Jesus left us with two uh, uh, things that he, he wanted us to do. One was baptism, and one was communion. And so this morning, our fourth son is here, Miss Philip, to do communion. So the only thing we ask, you do not have to be a member of this church to participate in communion. You just have to be a born again believer. That's all. You don't have to be a member. You're our brothers and sisters whether you belong to this church or not. Now, here's the other prerequisite. You must be sure that you have it right with the people in your life, with people, whatever, that you've forgiven, and you don't hold any bitterness or harbor anything in your mind or your heart towards anyone. Because the Bible says we drink, un we drink death unto ourselves. In other words, we can't be a hypocritical. It's perfectly fine for you to say, mm, I, I got some people I got to go get some stuff right. My heart has it been convicted today, so I need to get it right with some people. I'm going to pass on for me. That's way more honorable than to sit here and fake the funk. In other words, you don't for yourself. God sees everything. Don't, be, don't lie to God. That's boasting. Lying to God. We just talked about that. And you know you got stuff to be right with people. So those are the only prerequisites other than that. Please join in as we partake into this phenomenal thing called communion. Now, I'm going to ask everyone, make sure, does everyone have a, have a cup? No cup. Everybody good? All right, excellent. So on that night when Jesus knew that it was his last night with his disciples, he talked to them about uh, the meaning of where he was going. And he wanted them to understand how much he loved them. But he knew that next morning, or later that night, that he would be brutalized like never before. So I want you to take just a few seconds and just think about how he must have felt. He had to be very heavy because he knew he was walking into his last meal and then his last breath in just a few hours. So just take a few moments to think about how our Lord said that still
probably the longest so many of us have taken just to pause and just to meditate on the goodness of God like that. So much coming at us. And on that night, Jesus took the bread. Let me raise your eyes. He took the bread. He broke it. He said, take and eat this in remembrance of this night. For this is my body that was broken for you. Take, eat, and remember Then he took the cup and held it up and said, this cup is for the new covenant and for the remission of sin. Take and drink and do this often in remembrance of this time. <laughs> 